Hi, in this video, I'll be demonstrating the Eros E66 Studio Monitor. You can also get a smaller version, which is called the E44. Now, I've already used this for more than a month in order for me to give the review. I'm going to quickly show you what came in the box. All right, there's a quick user guide, some warranty information, a sticker if you want to support their brand, the country-specific power cable. You can see the IEC type fitting here. Right, so here's the speaker. The width is 46 centimeters. The depth is 25 centimeters. And the thickness is 21.5 centimeters. Right, the E66 comes with two 6.5 inch drivers. Then it's got a 1.25 inch silk dome tweeter. Over here, this is quite interesting. It actually turns, initially I thought this was a volume knob. All it is is the logo on a wheel that can turn depending in which way you've oriented the speaker. Right, it also lights up when you power up the speaker. Right, you can see there are four rubber feet. I stuck these on myself. It came in a little package, so you'll need to stick yours in if you are going to be putting this on your table. You'll notice there are two slit ports on the left and right hand side of the enclosure. Right, having a look at the connections at the back, you can use this in a country with 230 supply or 115. As you can see, you just toggle that. The frequency range is 50 to 60 hertz, so this can be used in many countries. There is a little fuse here. If it's for a 220 volt supply, it is a T1 fuse. Now you've got some controls here and I'm going to explain each one one by one, starting with the input gain. This is a little amplifier on the input stage which can increase the source level from a minimum to a maximum. They recommend leaving it at unity gain and then only if need be do you increase the gain. So when you're setting your speaker up, leave this at unity and then try and get your source at the right level. You've got the unbalanced and balanced connections. There you've got the female XLR and the 6.3 millimeter jack. Now you've got this section here which says low cutoff. What this does, this is a low pass filter built in. Flat means it doesn't attenuate any of the lower frequencies. Then it's got an 80 hertz and 100 hertz. Maybe you've got this in a small spaced room and it's already got quite a boomy sound. Well then you can remove some of the low frequencies. Then you've got a mid range and a high range equalization. So the mid range is at 1 kilohertz and the high is at 10 kilohertz. It does not say how steep the gradient is of these filters. You can attenuate it by 6 dBs or amplify it by 6 dBs in the 1 kHz zone. And for the high end, for the 10 kHz center frequency, you go up to 6 or you go down 6. Then you've got a 3 position switch which says acoustic space. 0, minus 2, minus 4. This is to do with how far the speaker is from the wall and also how big the space is where you are using the speaker. They've got three drawings here. If you look at the space, imagine this was the room there. So the speakers have a bit of a gap from the back wall and you can see it says zero dBs. Now the speakers and the mixing desk is closer to the wall. So they're saying minus two dBs. And then here you've got the speakers facing the person from the corner. Sometimes in corners we get quite a boomy sound and therefore they're saying minus four. They're not providing very scientific measurements here like half a meter or one meter. So you would have to just play around with that and determine what's the best sound for you. Right, before I set this up, I'm sure you want to see what it looks like inside. I'm the type of person who likes to see what I've purchased. So I'm going to open this up and show you what electronics are inside and the construction of the enclosure as well. Right, this is pretty tight, so I've just used a pair of pliers to peel this out. Right, so having a look inside, there's your two main drivers. There's your tweeter. I don't know if you can see it there. And interestingly enough, there's a potentiometer on that front knob, which you can turn depending in which way you orientate the speaker. So it's my assumption that they use the potentiometer as the swivel option. The potentiometer I don't think is doing anything other than just providing a swivel. Right, so let's just analyze this. We've got the power source. So you plug in over there. There's the country selector. There's your fuse coming into this transformer here. Right, if you have a look at the output stage, there's two blue, two red, and then a black. And then it says there blue, black, blue. That is 15 volts. 
and then red, black, red, 22 volts. So there's a few output windings there. And then we come into the smoothing and amplification section here. Yeah, we've, we've got two rectifiers there and there. So it looks like we've got one circuit just for the audio output, like the amplification, and then maybe one circuit possibly for the analog electronics to do the, to do the filtering. Because remember, this has got some active filters here, and therefore it uses op amps, and those op amps need to have a positive rail and a negative rail, meaning a positive and a negative. We've got 4,700 microfarads there and there. So you've got two FETs there, and there's a few resistors. But the output stage, interestingly enough, is an integrated chip. So we've got a TDA7294 IC over here, which is the output stage for the music. And there's two over here. All right, a pretty straightforward amplifier stage. I was hoping to see actual transistors. Right, I'm not gonna open this board. It's pretty obvious. It's just the connections to these op amps providing you with the active filters. Would be nice to see what type of capacitors they've used, but I'm gonna close this right now. In terms of the materials, this is like a super wood. It's not chipboard, and then it's got like a plastic wrap around it. If you do open this, the best way to close it is start at the center and move outward and then go diagonal. Right, so how do you place this speaker? Right, so you can have it like this in the horizontal plane. So you can have your left and your right in the horizontal plane. If it's in the horizontal plane, tweeter goes to the top. Look at the badge. If you're setting it up in the vertical plane, if this is the left speaker, then the tweeter's on the outside. Change this like that. You can see there's the sign. So you'll have your left and you'll have your right. Ideally, you should toe them in a bit in order to form a triangle. So you would have your left at an angle and you'd have your right at an angle so that the tweeter is aimed at your ear. So that also implies that whichever way you have the speakers, whether it's horizontal or vertical, the tweeter should be at the height of your ear. Right, this is the way I've set mine up. You can see that I've used a right angle IEC plug. Uh, just by the way, this is the kettle type plug, very common. And I'm using this one because I want to have this quite close to the wall, but that is not actually ideal. It's not ideal to have your speakers right against the wall unless they were designed for wall mount or wall placement. Um, it's just that my studio is structured in such a way that this needs to be quite far back. Now, also, I'm using a right angle here so I can get quite close to my wall. I've set my gain at unity. My mid is flat, my high is flat. I want a flat response. I don't really want the speaker's active filtering system to change anything. I always aim for acoustic equipment that does not alter the sound much. It should be tuned to a flat response. So, for example, you have this, this mid set high. Then when you're doing your mastering, you are going to be mastering based on an already present high mid-range. The whole point is that when you're doing your mastering, you don't want the sound to have any equalization so that you can master it based on the true signal that came from the vocals or from the instruments. So I'm hoping that the PreSonus amplifier here provides a flat response. I would have to test that using a function gen and a very elaborate speaker setup. Now, here it says low cutoff. So you can see that it's at flat. For me, I'm more interested in vocals. So I could then put that at 100. I don't need to get a strong bass response. And then the acoustic space, well, you can play around with that once the speaker is set up in your area. Right, then the other side of this is going to my little desktop audio interface. I'm using the Mackie Big Knob for now. Right, so here's my setup, and you'll notice a few things which are uncommon. The first thing is this is in the center when it should be on the left or the right. The second thing is it seems like it's quite low because this is supposed to be at the height of your ear. The third thing is there's only one of these speakers. Right, so this is an uncommon setup, and from this part of the review, this is just based on this setup. So why have I got it like this? Because I specifically want this, I specifically use the speaker for vocal mastering. On the left and right, I've got some monkey bananas. They're pretty good. And I'll quickly give you a sound test of this unit.
Right, my review of the speaker is as follows. Now, as you can see, I do use the speaker in an unconventional manner. There's the speaker in the center. What I do is I put my chair back and I lean back and I listen to the sound. So my ears are at a lower position. So I'm quite close to about this line. So on this mixer here, you can see I've got monitors A and B. What I found is this complements the monitors A very well. So by adding this speaker here in the middle, I really get an improved sound. Now these monkey bananas on the right and the left are not really monitoring speakers. They're not for studio monitoring, although some people do use it for that. And one of the reasons why I got this Eros 66 is because of the MTM design. I agree with that design. It's not a PreSonus thing. It was published in a journal many, many years ago, and it's the mid tweeter mid and what it does is it gives a very full mid sounding sound space now most speakers cannot deal with mids very well and the reason being if you just look at these speakers while, without knocking them you can see that this is also the bass driver and the mid and the minute you're putting bass through the mid you're going to reduce the capability of the mid range so in my application, I use this MTM speaker with the bass tuned down. That's why I like the fact that it comes with a built-in low-pass filter. I'm more interested in the vocal response rather than whether you can pump this and have a disco. So in that case, it does meet the requirements that I've set for it. Is it loud? Well, you saw the SPL meter sometimes over 100 decibels at more than one meter away. So yes, it is a loud speaker. But remember that when we're using this type of speaker in a studio, we don't necessarily want it very, very loud. We want it to be accurate rather than loud. And to be loud and accurate, well, that's the major challenge. So if I pull up the data sheet for the amplifier that is used in the speaker, it's the TDA7294. And having read it, I found it quite interesting. By the way, it does say that this is for top class TVs. It's a bit weird to know that my studio type monitors also run a same amplifier that would be in a TV anyway. Uh, this is an older amplifier. You can see it's February 1996 at the date of print of this particular data sheet. That is neither good nor bad. There are amplifiers from the 1980s that are still outstanding. So I'm not knocking it just because of the date. But what I am saying is this seems to be a tried and tested amplifier. And the data sheet even comes with the circuit layout, even the list of components that you should use for this type of amplifier. Now, what is of interest are the specifications. So if you look here, it says power output, RMS continuous power output. You'll see it says there minimum 60, typical 70. And over here, it says music power, RMS 100 watts. Will you get 100 watts out of the speaker? No, you won't. Because in order for you to get 100 watts, the amplifier stage is in total saturation, which means you're now in distortion. So if you have a look at the graph here, you can see that from about 55 watts upwards, the distortion, the total harmonic distortion increases actually exponentially. So if you look, if you're at here at 70 watts, you can see that the distortion level is much higher and you're almost at 10% near the peak. Now what we notice with class A, A, B and B amplifiers is that the power output or the power dissipated on the transistor or in the transistor in the PN junctions is much higher than the actual usable power that we can appreciate for music. So what that means is that maybe the transistor can give you 90 watts, but I'm from the generation where we usually say half of that is usable. So let's say 45 to 50 watts, and there you'll have the sweet spot. At that point, if you go any louder, you're actually just putting the speaker into saturation. Then you also have to look at the driver. I didn't see any branding on the driver. Now, these sound tests are a little bit silly, in my opinion, and I keep saying that. And many people say, how can you do a review without playing the sound? So you do the review, and I try to put two microphones there, and I probably should have used the Rode NT1 as the microphone because I was using a lavalier microphone and then a microphone connected to my camera. So you're really also just getting the response of the microphone. So you'll just need to trust me when I give you my review of the sound. So what is my reference? Well, 
in the old days, there was a company called Sears. They made drivers for other companies. Now, their mid-range, in my opinion, and their tweeters were outstanding. And the reason why I say were is because I'm talking about the older generation speakers. I see they've got some new models, but I haven't tried them. My current setup at home are two Silver Series monitor audio with a Rotel 200 watt RMS amplifier. In that case, the sound is full, the mid, it creates an amazing sound stage. Am I getting that with this Eros E66? No, definitely not. But the sound is loud, it is clear. So let me just put it out there and say this has a clear sound. When you play music louder, you can hear that it's starting to get muddy. But again, I don't think they've designed this as your main listening speakers in your lounge or TV room. This I understand as a very specific speaker and in the way I use it, it's providing me that function. I want to hear the vocals and I want the vocals to be clear. Is it clearer and more accurate than these monkey bananas? Yes, it is. The monkey bananas have a hi-fi sound. It sounds great. It makes the music sound great. Uh, when you play heavy metal, it doesn't sound great anymore. They're using Class D amplifiers, and I think the sound is too busy for the amplifier. While this is a Class AB, it deals with a busy signal. When I say busy, I mean lots of instruments. It deals with it much better. So if you have a look at these type of speakers, the Class D, acoustic sounds, live sounds it sounds good the, when i add the eros it's like you've added a dimension of mid-range which these monkey bananas for example did not have does it have good bass the bass is decent but for me the bass is actually a problem because too much bass is taking away from the mid-range so obviously it really depends on the application that you're going to be using the speaker for so overall what do i think well this is a versatile speaker you have the low pass filter which for me is extremely useful because i don't actually want a lot of the bass you could just put that off on your mixer if you've got a large mixer and then it's got this acoustic space sorry my screwdriver is in the way then what it does is it just attenuates the frequencies i think from 800 hertz down so it's removing some of that boomy sound and again, I found that very useful. So that makes this speaker versatile in that you can put this in many different types of rooms. However, this acoustic space drawing for me is very elementary. Where are the measurements? Where's the recommended displacements from the wall? Now, in terms of the construction, I think it's well constructed. But in terms of the noise, now why I'm bringing the word noise into it is when the speaker's at lowest volume or even unplugged, I'm getting a slight hum coming through. Every now and then I get a mmm, mmm, and I think that's got to do with the power supply. Yes, my studio is fed via a UPS and not a UPS that comes online when the power goes off. It's an online UPS using double conversion. So my power is extremely stable. I've set the frequency, the voltage does not fluctuate, but even if it did, this power supply here should be able to deal with it. So I'm not sure if it's just my unit, but I am getting a slight hum. It's definitely not a problem once the music's playing, and it's not all the time. And I'm not getting that on my other acoustic equipment, which is plugged into the same UPS. So what I'm getting at is I suppose they could have made a larger power supply considering they are saying that this is 70 or 80 watts. So in closing, I think it's a good value. I think this is for your middle of the range market. I think people who want to be able to have a studio could find a solution here with PreSonus. They have well-priced speakers that meet the checkboxes, AB amplifier, etc., Good frequency range, there you can see 45 hertz to 22 kilohertz frequency range. Here you have the amplifier, 80 watts they claim, the high frequency amplifier, 65 watts. Peak SPL at one meter, that I can confirm. You have the over temperature, you have some protection circuits available. You do get a one year limited warranty on the Eros. And if you're still not satisfied, in their manual they have a pre sonus rice dressing. No lies. So you have the cooking instructions for this particular dish. So if you're someone who does a lot of voiceover mastering or your own voiceovers, this speaker is great. Could this be your only speaker in your professional studio? No, you would complement this with another set of speakers. 
Is the sound accurate? I think it is. That's why I play the female vocals as a test. And I find that the mid range can handle the range of the female vocals that I've tested. Alright, so thanks for watching and 